All right, everybody ready to come back together for our last stretch into the, or last run or dive or whatever into the home stretch? <laughs> All right, so I had a little conversation with myself during the break about what I thought might be helpful. I'm, going to do what I plan to do about manage and track and evaluate and all that. But before we jump into that, I just, it seems like there were some resources that were of interest, and so I want to be sure that you're aware of what they are. Um, so the place that I would start is in your materials, if you go behind the first pink page and go back several pages to this page that's called Selected Resources for Court ADR Programs. The resources that I'm about to talk about are, there are links on these two pages for these. So you don't have to try and figure out how do I find this, whatever. I have this little binder that I keep on my desk and that I take with me to sessions like this and it just has like printouts of what I think are the most useful resources that I refer to on a regular basis. Um, and I've talked about a few of them, but I think it might help to go into them a little bit more. Um, so the first is the, well, okay, we'll start with the model surveys. So I mentioned these a minute ago, but I didn't go and talk about them very much. The, and I'm going to go a little bit further into this. So. Um, you'll see, you know, got information about what these are measuring, procedural justice satisfaction, mediator performance, ethical practice, competence, goal achievement, um, and it also collects information about the case characteristics at the time of mediation, um, because sometimes, you know, you, you might want to know, was discovery completed, were the legal issues complex, um, these, these surveys will give you a way to ask that more. Um, you know, it, we've got like how to hand them out, when to collect them, how to do all this. So here is the model party survey. We've got core questions for all the programs. And in here you'll see what we've done is we've sort of taken the survey, so that black letter you know, to help us maintain the quality, of the that's what would actually be on your survey. Um, and later on in the same document, we've got this, the survey without all of this uh, explanation included. But what we've done is explain, like, why are we saying this? Um, and, you know, the case name, the mediator's name, number, um, it just walks you right through and says, here's, here's why, why you're doing this. Um, and, you know, things like, what's your role in this case? Plaintiff, person filing the lawsuit, you know, we, we specifically tried to make these be more friendly to people who are representing themselves. Um, they're not just um, supposed to be for, uh, for lawyers. Um, was your lawyer with you at the mediation? Um, and then we start getting into the, um, the procedural justice questions. Were you able to talk about the issues and concerns that were most important to you? Was the mediator active enough in helping the parties work out the issues? How well did the mediator understand what was important? You know, so those are the ways, like, a lot of the time what we're, what we're trying to do is, uh, you know, we talked this morning about, you know, do you really save money doing a court mediation program? But there are all of these other benefits that you want in court mediation and you want to be able to measure them, right? So with surveys like this, you have a way to put a document in front of people, collect that information, and figure out whether or not you're attaining some of these other, um, other goals. Now, I have <laughs> I've heard some of my friends and colleagues in the field refer to these as like happiness surveys, like, okay, we all know everybody loves mediation, so what? But um, 
as we were saying before, not every mediator is going to provide the same uniform services. We want to have a way to be able to go back. You know, if somebody complains and say, all right, can we go back and look at David's, you know, surveys from the past couple of years? You know, are other people complaining about this too? Does this seem like it's a fluke? Um, so these surveys are really a way to help you gather that kind of information. Um, We, we do have these sort of open reply boxes, too, and as a, uh, that asks sort of what did you like, what did you not like about mediation. You know, this is the place where you sometimes get things like, we never would have gotten this settled if it hadn't been for this mediator, right? That kind of thing that is great in your grant application when you're promoting this to the court, you know, the ways that you, there, there's information in here, and we'll talk about promoting your program in a few minutes, but this is a place where you can collect some of that much more qualitative instead of quantitative kind of information. So these things that might just seem like, oh, they're just sort of open-ended, no, there's, there's a reason behind all of them, too. Um, and we get demographics. You'll notice for the demographics, we, we have the number in the household and then a pretty limited, you know, we stop it. 50,000, because really what we're trying to figure out is are, do people, are they poor and low income? We don't really care how middle class or how, you know, those, are. So, so that's why we did this, this particular way. Um, you may want to look at what the, um, the federal poverty guidelines are. You know, if you really are serving people who are, are who you believe are gonna be much more likely to be poor or low income, and put in some more specific numbers so that you can answer that kind of question depending on what kind of, uh, you know, if you're getting some other kind of grant money. Um, we have a question in here that we deleted. Um, is the settlement fair to you? And we just found that like nobody, um, like really, like it wasn't a useful question to answer. So we tested these, right? We didn't just like, a bunch of experts sit around and get on innumerable conference calls and then say, okay, this is what we're gonna do. We actually took them out, tested them, brought the results back and, and um, changed them. We've got some optional questions that you might wanna ask. Um, so this is just the mediator questionnaire. I mean, the, the party questionnaire. There's one for the lawyers, there's one for the mediators. You know, there is in those materials that are all available online that you can get to by clicking on one of these uh, addresses, every bit of information you could use to get at least to where you think you know, you think you wanna go in terms of surveying your parties. Um, and if you have questions, just let us know because we'll, we'll try and help you get over that hump. The thing is you do not need to invent surveys. What I have learned is that there's an art to writing surveys, who knew? <laughs> and that, that writing them well is, is not an easy thing to do. Um, so I would strongly encourage you to look at these when you're thinking about, about your surveys. Questions about surveys? Do you think surveys are something you would want to do in your programs? Or are you doing them in your programs? We have surveys for, for uh, the civil and for the domestic. Uh, the civil are hard. I can't hear you too much. Uh, we have both. We have both for the domestic and for the civil. So um, the domestic are live people that come into the court, so we can get the legal The other ones, the civil, are a little difficult because we send them out. Sometimes people return them, sometimes they don't. Oh, yeah. That How to get people to respond to surveys. I tell you, part of that is also in the culture that you create. Um, if you are developing a new program and you do your orientation for your mediators and you say, and then once you get to this step, then you hand out the surveys and then you're gonna do this step and then you're gonna collect the survey, you know, like put it into your process, then it just is what your mediators do. Um, trying to build it in later can be hard um, and there are, sort of upsides and downsides about, you know, 
am I really going to be honest if I'm going to hand this piece of paper right back to you who's just mediated with me? And so how do you collect those in a way that the, the parties can feel like they, um, they have more sort of anonymity about what they're saying? We have a little basket. The mediator hands them. And we train our mediators that there's a little basket. And so um, the people can just go out there and fill them out and then just turn them in. And they're easy. We tell them, please just put them upside down. Yep. So the mediator doesn't see them. Yes, the questionnaire baskets. They're coming to you in courts all across America. Um, yeah, sometimes we use one of those big manila envelopes that has the like little string that you, you know, and we just sort of pass it along and everybody, and we just put the little, all right. So there are lots of ways to do this. Um, let's see, what else did I? Okay, so I started to talk a minute ago about the National Standards for Court Connected Mediation Programs. Um, and I just want to show you a little bit about like how these work. So like the first thing they have is access to mediation, right? We were talking about access this morning. Um, and they start with mediation services to be available on the same basis as other services of the court. Like that's, yeah, that makes sense, right? Like if we just start from that from that basis, and they've got all the commentary, and it goes through, um, if you're doing everything that's in these standards, uh, I don't know what to say, that's remarkable, I've never known anybody who would do all that. Um, the other standards I wanna share with you are the, I mentioned them a minute ago too, the model standards of conduct for mediators. Um, Self-determination, you know, that is the place that we begin and end with mediation, right? That it's up to the parties to decide what their outcome is. I find that it's not a, a term even that's necessarily used every place that you go in terms you know, when they talk about mediation. Um, and so I would just encourage you to have this concept of self-determination. You know, we talked about what are your foundational principles that that's something that you just work into the whole way that you talk about your mediation programs when you're doing mediation. Let's see. And then the other place, so this is the RSI site, and you'll see there's this resource center that has a ton of stuff in it. The research library, we've got a few thousand abstracts of documents that you can go, you know, you can search and you can read about it and see if it's something that you want. Um, then Court ADR Basics, well, we can show you what Court ADR Basics is. Um, you know, this is really if you're just trying to communicate with people on a very kind of basic level about what you're talking about. Um, but depending on where you're going, if you're trying to sort of get people used to the idea of court ADR, that might be helpful. Um, court ADR across the U.S. has for every state um, a description of what is what the what their state of um, court ADR is. Let's go see. This is always dangerous because they'll probably have something very wrong about New Mexico, but. Let's go look anyway. So it's got a summary of you know statewide legislation and rules and policies and the state. Huh. See, it's wrong. No full-time state court ADR office. Sorry, Mateo. <laughs> I, I was the one who was supposed to come here and tell you that. Um, anyway, so it's not all up to date yet, but you get the idea that we um, are trying to have um, information on every, um, every state. Um, special topics, um, we've got, we've pulled together special resources depending on your profession, and we've got some by subject area, community, online, foreclosure. We've just talked about the model surveys, We've talked about the peer review tools, um, and you, you have all of those tools in your materials. Um, the guide to program success, those are the chapters that you have in your materials. 
Ah, and then this mediation efficacy studies. This was the, um, the work that I talked about earlier where our director of research has looked at all of the, the studies out there to say, you know, what, what, what's been done, when was it done, was it comparative? So there are, I think, about 80 studies in here that you can download this spreadsheet and go to town if you were so inclined. There will probably be one person in this room who's like, oh, I want to go look at that, and the rest of you are like, not the way I'm spending my evening. So um, that is sort of the Susan Yates hit parade of, um, of resources. Any questions about any of those? All right, so now we're at the now what? Um, the administer, track, evaluate, and promote your program. I just love this little guy. <laughs> um, that's where you find the materials for this section. So how do you know if you're doing a good job? Those national standards, but really this, the way that I define whether or not a, a, a court program is doing a good job, someone, has to wake up every morning with a feeling of responsibility for that program and be sure that it is administered and tracked and evaluated and promoted. What I have seen is if you don't have somebody who feels responsibility for the program, it's just going to sort of wither and go away. Um, so I mean, that may seem very basic, but you need somebody who's going to do that. Um, administering, the, you know, this first thing is follow your rules. I am amazed the people who are actually running our foreclosure and child, especially the foreclosure programs, they know what those deadlines are and when, like, I wrote the rules. I couldn't tell you what the deadlines are, but you need somebody who knows exactly what somebody, each party is supposed to be doing when, and so they can keep the cases moving through the ADR process. Um, effectively. Um, you know, I keep coming up with this, I'm just calling it, you know, it needs to operate in a business-like manner. I don't know that business-like is really, it's got to be a better term than that, because businesses do not always operate all that well. Um, but, you know, you want to be timely and efficient and all those good things. So for us in court ADR, the cases need to be referred in a consistent manner. The cases are scheduled promptly. The reports are provided back to the court on the individual cases. Um, things like there's a limited number of no-shows to your ADR sessions, right? Um, and the surveys are disseminated and collected. Just somebody has to be sure that all that happens. Um, and then the benefits of your program have to be reasonable as compared to the costs um, and other needs in the court. Um, Right? Nothing magic about that. Um, but somebody has to be thinking about it. Um, track your program. Remember those goals that we talked about early this morning? What are the goals for your program? Well, you've got to track your program now to find out whether or not you're attaining the goals that you set out. Um, so, you know, so you know by now that I love these cute little sayings. And the cute little saying here is, if it isn't counted, it doesn't count, right? You have to know how many cases are coming <coughs> through your system and what's happening. Um, to do that, you need these four things, collecting the data, um, analyzing it, disseminating reports, and taking action. Um, so the data has to be collected regularly. Um, it has to be quantitative and qualitative. Your data is going to come probably from your court CMS, you call it your CMS, your case management system, um, where you're going to get a lot of sort of the time frames of your cases, the cases that are going through ADR and those who are, that are not, and, um, and that you'd be able to track a change from this year to last year and see whether or not cases are going through more quickly or what have you. So the CMS, your surveys that we were just talking about, and your reports from your mediators. So you'll want your mediators to do reports about things like how many parties and how many sessions and how long the sessions were and, and that sort of thing. Um, and then also, of course, from the, um, 
uh, you're getting it from the model surveys. Um, you're going to want to have information like the case characteristics, right? We talked about that earlier. Like in your program, do you have certain kinds of cases within, you know, if you're doing a civil mediation, are some personal injury and some landlord tenant and, and what have you? Um, so you, and do you have different amounts in controversy? Because you want to look at that as compared to your other statistics. Um, you want to look at your demographics. Um, you really want to look at whether or not your parties were represented. Um, these benchmark dates, the settlement data, right? Was it settled? Was it not settled? Um, so that's a lot of the quantitative, the, like I said before, the qualitative that I, stuff that I love is the, um, those open-ended answers on the surveys. Um, but the other parts of the surveys are where you're going to get your procedural fairness and outcome fairness and um, that sort of thing. Okay, so you're collecting data, you're analyzing data. Um, so what are you going to report, right? Sometimes courts get to the place where they have so much data that they're just sort of awash in it. And they're thinking, okay, I have all this, but what do I, what do I really want to do with it? So again, go back to your goals, right? What was it that you set out to do? And then what data points are going to help you know if you're doing that? Um, if you set out to serve self-represented litigants better, see what their survey results are saying. Um, if you want a process to move more quickly, look at your time to closure. Um, and then within the time to closure, look at the different aspects of that, right? Because you know it's not just the ADR uh, activity that's, that might change that. Um, you want, I was saying already, you want to look at your report of, say, September 2019 compared to September um, 2018. Uh, you want to look at October, you know, August, September, October, right? So you want to look at this year compared to last year. You want to look at these three months that you're in the middle of, this quarter, what have you. You know, chop it up and, and look at it that way. Then you also really want to eyeball to see if there are changes in these uh, documents, uh, in the data that you're getting. Are you getting a different number of cases that are being sent? Um, are you getting a different number or proportion of agreements that are being reached in mediation? Um, are you having fewer mediators signing up to mediate? You know, there's, you know, we talk so much about data and big data out there in the world. This isn't really big data, it's kind of little data, but it is critical to the life of your program. Um, Yeah. So do you know what you, I'm going to break you up into small groups for a few minutes here, to talk about what data do you think you would want to be able to collect about your program and what seems like it would be a challenge? Okay, talk, to, talk amongst yourselves, just for a couple minutes. So let's come back to the large group again. Did you feel like in this conversation, all of a sudden you were thinking about, oh my gosh, there's all this data out there and I want to know all of it? That some, that's kind of what happens to me. I'm like, oh, I want to know this, I want to know that. And, or did you feel like, oh no, this, you know, there's really just a few things we need to know here. Where did you end up with thinking about your data? <laughs> I think I was, I was the first one Sorry, um, uh, what we were talking about was about time and how a case progresses and um, tracking the different time frames of getting to certain places with the case. Yep. 
Well, and if you are talking about those sort of mid-sized civil cases, then, um, then you are gonna have more of those sort of time mileposts, signposts along the way. Pat, were there particular areas that this little group down here, what were you thinking of in terms of your data? Well, I, I jokingly said at the beginning, let's, I want everything, but then, <laughs> then we started talking about the specifics in terms of, um, you know, how long did it take to resolve the, the case did it settle, did it not settle? How long did the mediation session last? Mm -hmm. Was it more than one session? How, and then we started looking at maybe focusing on the mediator, how mm -hmm. successful, a success rate, I guess, if you want to call it that. We don't call it that, we call it a resolution call, rate. Resolution <laughs> rate, right. So, what was that mediator's resolution rate? That, that sort of stuff, we started sort of focusing into what we really wanted to know. Mm -hmm and that resolution rate by different types of cases. Um, did I already tell this story about the personal injury cases and the real estate cases? We, we started a, a program a long time ago and we had these great, really respected litigators who became the first batch of the mediators and it was going great and they were resolving lots of cases and so the judges started suggesting more and more and the resolution rate started dropping off. I'm like, what's going on? Well, it, turned out that the first wave of cases were a lot of the personal injuries or car accident cases and a lot of the mediators were on one side or the other in personal injury cases and so they were really good at settling those um, and then the judges were like oh we're sending these cases and they're getting settled so let's send some contract cases and let's send some real estate and then these mediators who were relying a lot on their substantive knowledge instead of on their skills necessarily were like, oh no, we, we don't know enough about these cases. Like, so then we did a couple things. We trained some more in skills um, and we also diversified that, that roster more. Um, so you do want to look at I mean, really, you know, what is resolution rate, you know, how many cases in resolution rate, it's not the be all and end all, but if I have a group of cases where, you know, 5% are reaching resolution, I'm gonna worry about that. And if I have a group where 95 or 98% are reaching resolution, I'm gonna kinda wonder about that because I'm gonna think, like, what's going on that, that these cases are settling? You know, is it the mediators? Is it the, you know, why do we even need mediation if they're settling? So, I look at the outliers. You know, I'm trying to figure out what's, what's and I'm looking at the change, um, right? So that resolution rate that, that dipped. Yep. Do you ever do analysis on the technology, such as recently we've been using, um, we've been doing a lot of telephonic mm -hmm. uh, mediation, and um, it, I thought it was just a few of our mediators were not happy with it, or but I'm starting to see that more and more of the mediators are, it's not working as well for them. So the question was, do you ever look at sort of the media or the, um, the technology that you're using? You, you need to. Um, I can't tell you that I can think of a time that I've needed to do that, but if you're using different kinds of technology, definitely. Um, and as we all use more and more technology in our lives, um, we're gonna need to be looking at, at that more closely, um, especially when we circle back around to these issues of procedural justice. Um, yeah, uh, I know just from my own experience when I've had, um, like it worked fine in foreclosure cases when I had the lawyer for the lender and the, the homeowner and usually his or her counsel if they were represented and then the bank was on the phone um, that that could work, but having one party present and the other party on the phone, oh no, that just, for me, I just found that really hard to do. Um, because when, when I'm mediating, I'm establishing eye contact and rapport, oh. right? And I've got somebody over here on the phone, and so I would find myself like asking a question of the party, and then turning and looking at the phone, and ask, but. It, you don't really establish rapport in quite the same way when you're just looking at the telephone. So yes, you, um, as our technology ability broadens, we're gonna need to keep, keep looking at that. So that way from online. Oh yeah. yeah. Well, and 
you know, I think we're gonna find out with online, you know, where its strengths are and where its weaknesses are. And, you know, a lot of the things that we have said about parties having that human interaction in a mediation that can really change things, you're probably not gonna get online. Although what is online, I, I could go off on the online thing for quite a while, because online goes everywhere from, you know, just these platforms where you're sort of texting back and forth to like a, a, a Skype kind of, or Zoom, right? Where I'm here looking at mine, you're there, you know, we, it's, nobody's in the same room, but we're all looking at similar screens and, so what is ODR and what that impact is, it's gonna, that's all over the place and we're gonna need to look at that closely. Um, where was I? Yeah. Um, data dissemination. Um, so the, you're gonna have different stakeholders, right? And those stakeholders are going to need to get different kinds of reports. Um, all of them need to get reports that are easy to read, that use some good visuals, that don't rely on insider language or undefined acronyms. Um, and and you're if you've got outside funders, you're gonna, they're gonna have some sort of form that you're gonna need to be completing. Um, but you really want to adapt your reports to particular audiences. Um, so starting with the, the judge and the court administrator who are most closely tied to the program, you're gonna see a lot. And it's not gonna be in a sort of a beautiful, presented way necessarily. You're gonna see a lot of um, not quite raw data. You're gonna see a lot of charts and, and that sort of thing. Um, and some of that's gonna need to just stay confidential within the program. Um, and the, um, things like individual mediator settlement rates, right? You're not sending that out. You're not sending out things like, you know, if different judges are referring cases, which of their cases are, you know, you, you're not identifying those individuals out there with, with statistics. Um, so the closest you are to it, you're gonna get a lot of data. But then as soon as you start going up the chain of command in the court system, people will get sort of more and more refined information. But they still need to be getting that information. Um, you know, you're getting more sort of summaries. You know, instead of a whole bunch of charts, you'll get like one chart and a sentence that summarizes maybe what you had in some of those other charts. You know, you, you, right? Do we all really read everything? No, we all skim a lot these days. I don't know, maybe you read everything, I don't. I do a lot of skimming and so I think we need to write our reports in a way that skimmers can get the information that we want them to get. Um, so who would be the most important audience for you for your reporting? The tab. All right. Because the boss. <laughs> They want to know what's working, or they want some stats, and so it's appropriate that he has that information. So it goes from you to Mateo to whoever is working with the legislature to try and keep the funding coming, so that the funding then keeps coming back to your program. Yeah, and for you all to like just be clear about that, because I think some places it's like, oh, we just have to do these reports and you know, we never see anything that comes of them, and, but we, we just do them because we have to do them uh, is not the most effective way. The other, the other side of it, the other reason that it's important to know how many mediations were actually held and, and how many were actually settled, it's important to some of the mediators we actually have um, one of our mediators who works for the federal government, and he is permitted to be a mediator in our court on a volunteer basis because he has the stats and the data to support that it's improving his job because he has this, he provides this volunteer service, so. Cool. 
So I think that's a perfect example. I could never have dreamed up like, oh, you might need to be reporting some stats to the federal government so that probably a pretty good mediator is able to still keep mediating for you. Um, so you know that that's a great example of how you're just going to need to know to figure out what people really need. Um, we have a, an odd funder uh, in, in Illinois, and I'm always careful about exactly what I send him because I send him stuff that I know he's going to be interested in, but I don't dump a lot of information on it. You know, it's really, it's tailored information. Um, so, tailor away. Um, <laughs> And the other thing is to tell stories, right? Um, I, and sometimes it's a lot easier than other, you know, child protection cases, you know, you get these amazing, you know, the, the children were removed and they were staying with auntie and auntie and the mother, you know, had not gotten along for years and then they were in the mediation and they began to understand each other and they asked if they could hug and, you know, it's like, oh my God. You know. So sometimes you have these amazing stories, not all the same in sort of personal injury. You know, we had this car accident and I had soft tissue injuries. It's a little harder to come up with a big, a big heartwarming story there. But you, you want to have stories, not just numbers. Um, and, and if you're reporting outside of the court where people are not going to know what a personal injury case is, you're going to need to have some words in there that describe, you know, these cases are most typically, you know, car accidents and X and Y and Z, what have you. Um, ah, then you need to take action, right? Um, so you've done all these reports, and, um, and if I am doing these reports, I'm looking at them, and I'm, and I'm running my program, then I'm saying, oh, well, this is showing that we need to do X. And so before I even send this report up the chain of command, I'm going to write this report in a way that ends up telling the story of why we need to do X. So we had a variety of foreclosure mediation programs in Illinois, and we were collecting all kinds of data. And, um, and it turned out that one court was getting about half as many cases and their, um, as the others, um, as many cases in, and a, a related number, lower number of homes that were retained. Well, when that court saw those numbers compared to the others, they were like, well, wait a minute, why? why? Well, because you're doing your system this way, you know? So that court was very happy to change exactly how the cases were getting into the system. Their numbers bumped up and they sort of equated over the different, the different circuits. Um, so sometimes, um, all the time really, as the frontline person looking at those stats, you wanna think about what do these really mean and how am I gonna present them and when I'm showing them to this, this court where they're get, they should be changing something, how do I present them in a way that's gonna be most palatable and most encouraging to make changes that you think should be made? Right? Um, all right, and evaluating your program. Um, Evaluation is different from this sort of monitoring and tracking. Evaluation is where you really take a deep dive and you want to see, wait, I got this phrase right. Um, evaluation uses data to determine how well a program is functioning and whether it's doing what it was designed to do. Um, and then it results in actionable recommendations. Right. So an evaluation is going to tell you, did you know those goals that we talked about? Are you accomplishing your goals? Um, best practice again, you know, if you start a program about a year into it, you want to do a deep dive evaluation and see if this is really working. But then, you know, this is not something you do every few years. You know, you can really wait a, a substantial amount of time unless something big changes. Right? So um, I'm not sure what that might be, but if there's a, a, a big change, then you probably are going to want to um, evaluate it a little bit sooner. There are, there are many different types of evaluation. Um, I, our director of research is our expert pro, and so I try 
try and channel her at moments like this, but, um, but I think she's taught me a few things. So the process kind of evaluation is really just looking at, is it working the way we thought it was gonna work? You know, are the time frames working out? Are the outcomes what we expected? Um, um, are there strengths that can be built upon? Where does it need improvement? Um, an outcome evaluation is more goal-oriented. Um, you know, is it settling cases? Is it providing voice to parties? Um, and then an impact evaluation is looking more at causation. You know, is your program uh, causing a change which can be something like, is there a lower time to case closure or lowering costs or leading parties to have more positive opinion of the courts? So those are sort of three rough ideas about evaluation. Finding an evaluator is difficult. Um, and I say that, you know, before we developed our own in-house ability, we hired any number of people and did not find that it was a terribly satisfactory um, experience because court ADR is a very niche thing, right? Like you have to be able to understand ADR and how the courts work and what the goals are. And, you know, it's a, we're sort of a whole world unto ourselves, right? And so, you know, I've seen courts say like, oh, well, you know, our, our chief judge's um, daughter is finishing up her master's degree. She needs to do a, some sort of a study. She could evaluate how our program is going. This, is, this does not always work well. Um, so evaluation is, is different from this kind of monitoring that we're talking about. For a lot of people, those statistics and everything we were talking about with the monitoring is gonna be plenty. Um, and evaluation is gonna be a much more infrequent experience. Mm -hmm. I have two support staff people, one in Cruces and one in Clovis, who's sitting over there, wonderful person. Um, and they have an impact on how we perform, mm -hmm. an incredible impact on how we perform. And how do you evaluate them in a way? I mean, how do, I'm not seeing that in the yeah. stats. Because if you go to a court where you're not getting that support, it's very difficult to do your job. And I'm very blessed. I've got two great courts that are working well with me and that I'm hopefully doing the same back for them. And um, I have one court that we're just starting out and it's, it's not the same. Yeah. <laughs> so um, how do we bring the, those wonderful people into this? Because it's very important. It's very important. Yeah, I... I can't tell you that I've thought about this before, but my kind of initial reaction is that you do that more through your regular employee evaluation and development process where you are working with that person and setting goals and seeing how they are attaining those goals and, um, and those goals are going to relate to what you're accomplishing in your program, but they're the things that that employee has control over, right? So um, the employee doesn't have control over the no-show mediators, but does have control over, <coughs> excuse me, whether the, um, the notices to the mediators about signing up or what, you know, they're going out on time. And so you, you have to sort of divide what those people can do in their role from what the program needs to do. <coughs> Not a wholly satisfactory answer, but that's the best I've got right now. Um, promoting your program. So we talked about these reports that have to communicate effectively, right? And then the different stakeholder groups, um, it's a terrible play on words here, but they're courted appropriately, um, right? You want to provide them the information that they're interested in um, and you've got a lot of different ways to do that. Um, a lot of people start by thinking about brochures, but these days there aren't a whole lot of uses for brochures. The one time that they are really useful is if you have people who are either going into the clerk's office to file or who are going into court and somehow you want to send them to a different step 
and you want to give them something that says, here, this is what you need to do with instructions or a website or, or what have you. So um, I have seen the use of brochures really reduced um, over the past years. Um, the news. Um, this varies incredibly. Um, what I saw, again, you know, when we did the civil mediation programs, the local news in these small news markets was interested in that because it was a group of leading attorneys, usually, I'm sorry, attorneys, who were being um, invited to do this and they were going through this training and the court was doing this new thing. So in a small media market, that might be news. Um, the foreclosure programs were often newsworthy, but just due to the regular operations of your civil program or whatever are probably not newsworthy. And with child protection, you never want to be in the news because that just probably means that something horrible has happened. Um, at least that's been my experience of it. But um, that's sort of general public media. You also are going to have, you know, does the court have a newsletter? Does the Bar Association, do other sort of professional organizations have newsletters where you want to be appearing on a regular basis just to kind of keep your, your program in front of mind? Um, and let's talk about websites. Whew. Often a court ADR program appears someplace on the court's website and it's really hard to find. Um, and so one question I would have for you is how are you going to go about having an online presence that people are going to be able to find um, that is going to pr present everything that you want to present about your program. Um, I've, I've found that that can be really difficult. Okay. Um, what about social media? Does anybody in the court use social media? What do you do? Uh, I mean, our, our PIO. PIO uses SJD. Yeah, so you should not write any of these things if you're going to use acronyms for everything. <laughs> um, yeah, but for courts, usually the social media presence is very um, condensed into like one in entity that has the authority to post on social media. If that's the case, and you're over here running your ADR program you probably want to get to know that person so that then they can post and, you know, when you come up with those stats that show, you know, 2019 we did more mediations uh, serving self-represented litigants than ever before, like, yeah, that would be a great little tidbit to get out there on, on social media. Um, I don't think that's going to make or break any of our court programs today, but what's going to happen in the future, who knows. Um, I think the other... The other challenge with promoting your program is sort of promotion education. When you have turnover, getting the new people to know what it is that they need to know about the program and how it operates. Uh, if that's a judge that's referring cases, if that's a clerk who has transferred from one division of the court to another, um, you can, you can lose a lot of forward momentum if you aren't paying attention to that kind of small change in your environment. Um, I think that's what I had about track, promote, et cetera. Are there other things that you want to talk about in terms of evaluating your programs or tracking them or monitoring them? or? Oh, I know, one point that I really wanted to make that I have not made. The reason that you do all of this regularly, of sending out these reports, et cetera, is so that you aren't going to people the first time when you need them to help you. 
right? You don't want to, you know, be threatened with losing your funding and then you're going to people and saying, oh, yeah, did you know about what we've been doing? Like, no, you want people to know, know about your success stories before you need them, right? Um, our child protection mediation director is out at the uh, child welfare quarterly meetings all the time, just doing a quick update about what's happening with the mediation program, just to keep it out there. And you know, and you know, if all of these uh, child welfare advocates and the CASA people and everything think that this mediation program is great, if sometime the court's thinking about, oh, maybe we don't need this mediation program, you've got a lot of people who are in your corner. Does it help if you are thinking about? Very scattered in our courts. And, um, <coughs> scattered. Well, we have geographically. geographically, we're very wide apart. And um, I was just wondering if we had those kind of stats, if other courts would just be involved in and, and possibly want to start even in a smaller court. Yes, what, um, what I have seen is that those statistics can be helpful. Um, the most useful tactic that I have seen is to have a judge here who likes it go talk to the judge there. Um, then, you know, if that happens, then other things can flow from it. Um, and that judge may take those statistics to talk to the other judge. Um, but, you know, you want to have clerks talk to clerks and judges talk to judges and mediators talk to mediators, you know, because we each sort of speak the same language with our colleagues. I have told you everything I came here to tell you. Um, I am ready to call it a day, even though it's early, but I got special dispensation from Mateo that that would be okay. Um, is there, are there any, now, having said that, if somebody says, yeah, I've got this long, lengthy question, then everybody else is like, oh my God. Um, so maybe uh, if you have a long, lengthy question, then uh, come see me afterwards. Um, but. I got it. This has been so much fun, and you have been such a great group. And oh, and Mateo has things he wants to say. Uh, oh, because I think Mateo wanted to call on the judge to say things. So if you want to. I, I have another question. Uh, or I have a question for you. Sure. Do, do you want to uh, talk about uh, the, the uh, chapters that are to come um, that you're working on? Sure. Um, so we have upcoming chapters on uh, writing your rules and we have examples of exemplary rules from around the country and what we think makes them really good. Um, and we have our evaluation chapter coming up. And we must have one more and I'm just not remembering what that other one was, is. Um, yeah, so I will let you know and then you can let everybody else know when those go on. Um, oh, you can, if you want, um, Thank you. You can sign up to get our newsletter or other kinds of information. I'm not sure where I put that. Um, so I would be happy to keep everybody up to date with the, the newsletter. Um, I will just leave these up here. So if anybody wants to sign up for that, we have business cards, if you have questions to follow up. Can you sign up for Go to our aboutrsi.org and it's all over the place there. Well, thank you. This has been a great day. Thank you very much.